Okay, hello, everyone. Hi, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, this is the Brooklyn Rails 563rd New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, the Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the real pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Stephen Hull, George Kasha, Irini Tsarelia, and Susan Widas. We're thrilled to welcome poet Mia Malhotra here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. Today's conversation will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel where you can view the full archive of this series. And now to introduce today's guests and host, Stephen Hole, the founder of T-Space, has published numerous texts and has lectured widely. He was named by Time Magazine as America's best architect. Stephen Hole Architects Project Projects combine sustainable technology and forward-looking approaches to urbanism and architecture. George Quasha works in diverse mediums to explore certain principles, for example, axiality and eco-proprioception. For his primary medium poesies, he has invented the genre preverbs as a medium of axial language and linguality at zero point. Among numerous publications, there are 13 books of preverbs to date, of which seven published most recently, not even rabbits go down this hole and waking from myself. Hmm. International Associate AIA Irini Tsarelia is Director of Educational Programs at T-Space, where she has instructed the summer architecture residency since 2017, when she co-developed the program. She has curated exhibitions in Greece and New York, and currently she's co-curating pamphlet architecture visions and experiments in architecture. Susan Widers, curator and director of T-Space, has curated over 30 exhibitions, as well as their poetry, music performances, exhibition texts, and publications since 2010. Widers is a photo-based artist. Nature and perception are driving forces of her work, and she's had numerous solo exhibitions, and her work resides in the permanent collection of the Brooklyn Museum, ICP, among many others. Our host today, of course, is our very own Fang Bui, and I will turn it over to you, Fang. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, it's a pleasure. How terrific to get this chance to be the host of our NS number. Uh, just, to, just to tell you how many we've done, Nine, number 563. Uh, in this instant, we are featuring the amazing tea space assemble. So I'd love to welcome Stephen, George, Arini, and Susan. Uh, I'm so happy that you can join us. So before uh, we explore the magical creation of tea space, I thought maybe it would be productive if I were to ask one or two questions to you each. So let's just uh, begin with Stephen, for example. I I, I just want to say that the first time I moved to New York, Stephen, in the mid uh, late 80s, uh, my uh, introducing, being in introduction to a friend, I think uh, was Raymond Abraham at that time was teaching at Cooper Union. Right. The first Raymond. time I knew about your work is really storefront for art and architecture because I was living in the East Village, so I, you know, I seen that space so many times over and got to know the founder, uh, Keon Park, and later his wife, then wife, Serena Sa. So it's really uh, terrific to have known your work through Raymond Abraham and but later through David Shapiro also, both associated with Cooper Union. And then I eventually meet John Haydeck the great Haydeck, and then all the members of the New York Five, <laughs> one by one, gradually. So I learned eventually, uh, you know, of the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies. Uh, and then later, soon later, I met the great Ada Louise Huxtable. Through oh my yeah, she was fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. So I met her through my mentor, the late publisher, George Brazila. 
whom she created a whole amazing series. Uh, it's called Master of War Architecture, something I would love one day to recreate through the real edition. But I remember reading it. It's so eminently readable, whether be it, you know, Vincent Scully on Frank Law Wright, whether Arthur Drexler on Ms. Van der Rohe or another. So really, really about getting to know more about the history of architecture, particularly. So the first thing I want to ask you so badly, which I didn't manage to ask you the last time we met, uh, can you share with us, Stephen, your early interest in Merleau-Ponty phenomenology and perception and how it helped shape in your own idea of architecture so early on? Well, it wasn't so early on, Fong. It was it was uh, actually, I was quite, quite along in my, I was already moved to New York. You mm. know, I came to New York on a, an excursion fare ticket from San Francisco in 1976 on New Year's Eve. My brother's an artist mm. and uh, I came and uh, I never took the return half of the excursion ticket. I was enamored with New York and the Institute and the energy at that time was enormous. And it was also an economic place to live. You know, in 1977, you know, yeah. I had a studio that I paid $75 a month for. So, no, it wasn't early on. It was later. It was 1984. I can, I, I you know, I, I developed kind of from early influence of Aldo Rossi and the rationalists. I, I lived in Rome. I studied at the AA. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I wanted to make my own way. And I, I was coming at it from typology and morphology and uh, it was on a train ride i went to a symposium in banff in 1984 and the train left from from toronto and went across the transcontinental rail line of canada and i was sat next to a philosopher yeah. and he started to talk about merleau ponty who yeah. i never heard of at that time and i t i started to listen to him and i started to think that I'm, you know, I have to change my ways. And on that trip, there's a thing called the spiral tunnel, where yeah. this transcontinental train goes on this tunnel and reaches another height. The only way the train can that incline is they cut the tunnel as a spiral. So I figured that I went in on one side as a typologist and a rationalist, and I came out the other side as a phenomenologist. So it was a kind of overnight trans, trans, trans you know transformation for me and then after that i found a way that i could connect philosophy and architecture and art and 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 everything in experiential life it's funny that george kwasha is there in the corner and he was an influence through through the translations that station hill press made when i first came to rhinebeck i was reading you know many of the, the Station Hill Press books, and I still have them in my library. So it wasn't early, it was kind of a, you know, midway. Early in the sense that it created the, your own maturity, so to speak. It helped the rich. Right, absolutely. No, I mean, I, it, it would also help me as a teacher, uh, you know, teaching. I still teach with my wife, Demetra, at Columbia University. We yeah. teach a class called the Architectonics of Music. And in our studio class, you know, we, we give certain readings and yeah, it, it's a grounding. Yeah. Well, I always, you know, admire George Eliot's statement because she didn't get to write until she was in her late thirties or even early forties. She said, it's never too late to become what you might have been. <laughs> so, so the great thing about culture is not a horse race, you know? We right. come when we're ready, or when we're ready, it hit us, whatever the epiphany is. Uh, what about um, Johanny Palasma? Because I know that his work had a significant impact on your thinking. That well, he's a great friend. He's a great friend. And we met early on, uh, but then the transformational moment was the Chiasma Museum. You know, that's a building now that's almost 25 years I was just there in Helsinki. They've restored the whole, it's really great. And I was just, I just had a, a dinner with the Johanny Palasma. He's 85 now, but he, he and I, you know, we agreed on so many points 
And uh, we wrote a book together, Questions of Perception. Um, it's been republished a number of times, yes. which is a, is a kind of a phenomenology of architecture, how to approach, you know, experientially, what is architecture? And, and he's written a lot of books. And uh, yeah, he's an old friend, but, you know, the, the I almost didn't, <laughs> I won the competition, but I almost was kicked out because they really didn't want to, there's a long story, but anyway, Johanny helped me build that building. So his, he, his office and my office worked together as a big collaboration to the Osmo Museum. He's actually popular contemporary art space in London. Yeah, uh, we got cut out a little bit there, but I'm sure Stephen will get back. Here you are, you're back. Um, yeah, so thinking about your your, okay. your early experience that you know that that seemed to be cross pollinate all of the things that you were interested, you know, just mentioned about George, for example. So my, I mean, we need to really have a, a, a lengthy conversation with you one day, just on your work only. But now, since it is the creation of T space. I love to immediately bring the, the first question. I mean, what was the initial impulse in creating T space? And how long the making required from the beginning as an idea to it being materialized in, I believe, in 2010. You can correct yes. me wrong. Um, so let's see what the, we, we can hear that story. Well, it's Basically, it wasn't a premeditated creation. It was the, the notion of making an experiment, an experimental space in Rhinebeck. And, you know, I mean, uh, we, we didn't know, <laughs> we didn't have a program except mm -hmm. for the idea of the synthesis of the arts, that art and architecture are related. You know, I, I really believe that firmly. I hate this separation of things into categories. Mm -hmm. So this notion that that the synthesis of the arts would be the core, uh, let's say, mission, so mm -hmm. that we would have, it, you know, we would have a show. Then we would also, when we opened the show, we'd have a poetry reading and a piece of music, sometimes commissioned for that event. So the every time we have an opening, this sort of notion of the synthesis of the arts is part of the nature of the activity. And, yeah. uh, and we started with my brother, uh, James is a sculpture, a sculptor and a painter, and, and, and we didn't have a program. We opened the show October, I think it was October 10th, 2010. You know, the building was just finished. And, uh, well, we can show some slides, I guess, pretty soon. But anyway, that's, it was like a spontaneous act that we thought, we didn't know what the next act would be. In other words, you know, it was like a chess game. Put out there and someone make a move is anybody interested and by 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 astonishing degree people are interested and that's what was shocking you know i mean in a way it's huh. you know it's it was there were more people that wanted to show there because they knew it was not a commercial gallery it was about an idealism mm -hmm. it was about the relation the synthesis of the arts nothing is for sale you mm -hmm. know the art world today is a kind of strange you know capitalistic uh, oh, it's like, yeah, it's like it's like. Come on, I mean, they just sold a, you know, a hundred ninety-five million dollars for a, a whole, and yesterday eighty-five million for a basket. I don't know. I mean, to me, it's almost like the stock market. And what are the principles? What are the core values? And we we wanted to do something that would be, you know, more, more based on, you know, almost like rejection of New York City art market. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's how, that's how things should start because I know that when I helped co-founded The Rail, we resist having a mission statement. You know, I, we wanted to reflect the artist's journey, the making of things, you know? And I, I think it, it's, it's true. Um, Leonard Bernstein once said, to do great thing in life, you need two things. One, somewhat of a plan. Number two, 
not enough time to execute it. <laughs> it's just fantastic. <laughs> so, so why don't, on that note, can we now go to some images and then invite Susan to contribute, maybe walk us through some of the images. Any of you really can interchangeably contribute because it's so immersive. Yeah, well, um, well I'll, go ahead, Stephen. You should start. I'm gonna start with the first three because, and then I'll turn it to Susan. This, yeah. this, is, this, is, this is actually in one of our catalogs, the mission, the synthesis of the arts, painting, poetry, architecture, and nature. You see nature, nature, nature. Then the, you know, this, this is located in Rhinebeck and now we have a 30 acre sculpture walk that's a nature preserve. So the, you know, it's, it's, it's a very complex uh, embracing attitude. And I think that diagram there is really more, explains the mission more than I can with words. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, I just read, and I, I must say, the Brooklyn Rail is one of the only, one of the only, you know, art papers that I read. And I just read Meb's review uh, from April. Next slide, please. And it's a coincidence that the moment we started T-Space is when I, when we installed Cone of Water by Meg Webster. Can we get the next slide? So that's been there <laughs> Beautiful. for the same amount of time. And uh, Meg is an old friend of mine. And we also have one of another called Cone of Earth, but the nature of Cone of Earth and over 10 years it sort of dissolved. But Cone of Water is still there. I think that that photograph is from years ago. It's still there. It automatically fills with water and drips over the side. It's Beautiful piece of steel and art. Yeah. Meg Webster. Amazing. But the building itself is a T, is a T space. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I made it, I, I, it's, it's a, it floats on nine columns. It has nine elevations. Yeah. And it's a simple plan. And the idea was to make the smallest possible space, all natural light. No heating, cooling, no plumbing. It's all organic. And, uh, and you would not be able to see the entire interior with one shot. So that, that's why you have a T. There's yeah. always something around a corner that you can't quite see. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's a little bit like what life is like, you know. And then all these <laughs> elevations are composed according to the golden section. Yeah. So you have squares, golden sections. And it was, it was curious when Bryce Martin installed his show there, it, he respected totally and aligned with all these visible proportional lines in the space. And he said it was his favorite exhibition. And that's pretty strong words from Bryce Martin. <laughs> it's super true. The cold mountain drawings. Yeah. Yes. It's super yes. true. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautifully conceived and generous and yet it's really very specific for view and experience, as you say, Stephen. Absolutely, it, it's transformable. People have ripped walls out, take the stair out, close the windows, you know, nail anything on. Susan, why don't you describe this one? This is Richard Tuttle and Mamie. Harrison Brugge, yes. Uh, so, you know, we, I think this was, you know, this was 2015, it was our first, um, probably our deepest um, collaboration between um, discipline of sculpture and poetry so far um, at that point. And um, May May, uh, many people know, um, has a very fine book called Hello the Roses. And Richard um, did a series of sculptures, this is one of them, um, that was in response to the book. So it was a very beautiful collaboration. Um, one, one visitor had said, um, these aren't sculptures, they're nets to, to catch poems. It was very beautiful. They, um, Richard had said, it's really a trio. Um, we'll the next one. The uh, sculpture of Richard, the poetry of Amy, and um, the architecture of Stephen, um, the space. I was wondering about the, um, can we, should we change the, 
the um, slideshow, who's doing the slideshow, should that be done by the rail? Because it's not working very well here. Um, in yeah. The yeah. Let me see if we can revisit that a little bit. The rail has the slideshow, Carolyn, would that work for you? Uh -huh. Just give me one minute and I'll, um, yeah. I'll pull it up. Yeah. Why, why are we waiting for Carolyn to do that, Susan? Can you describe briefly how do you get involved? Yes, yes. So, I mean, like Stephen was saying, it, it, it kind of, it evolved very naturally. He had this idea to, to make this, this gallery space. Mm -hmm. um, our family is made of artists and architects, and we all sort of share these values and bonds in that way. And we were sitting around the dinner table. I'm um, Stephen's brother is Jim Hall, the artist, and mm -hmm. um, Jim is my husband. Mm -hmm. And we, um, you know, Stephen brought up the idea of synthesis of the arts and this new gallery. And we said, yeah, we're in, let's do it. So um, the first show uh, was Jim's um, and we combined it with poetry and music and then we were off we were just you know we were living part time upstate and um the whole idea of sort of the density of new york city which we love the density of artists and interaction you know we're missing that a little bit upstate and we just really put it out to you know our hudson valley you know people far and wide and we were so thrilled that people you know responded and we, we started from there, um, you know, asking people like some of our, um, uh, so, well, we, you can continue the slides now. Um, we can go through the slides. You know what, now that we're on this slide, I'm just gonna pivot a little bit. But this was, this was another amazing synthesis where, you know, mo many people know that Bryce Marden's um, Cold Mountain drawings in uh, the eighties, were inspired by the poetry of um, the, the poet Cold Mountain. And Red Pine um, is the foremost translator of Cold Mountain's poetry. And uh, so we, we, asked, we asked Bryce to, to show this you know, seminal body of work and um, invited Bill Porter, uh, otherwise known as Red Pine, to sing um, and chant the, the, the poems of Cold Mountain at the opening. It was a really beautiful, um, experience. You can continue the slides. Um, this the, let me this. This is Joseph Ubi, mm -hmm. the chapter of three pieces of architecture and three paintings. And he is the last living protege of Le Corbusier. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's still kicking. He's 92 and uh, not in the best of health. I just, just spoke with him two days ago. But you know, we we you know we had we we had the idea that we, he we would commission build a chapel, small chapel. And you can see there in the form, concrete form. It's only 16 square, and we you know we never really could raise the money to build it. But we we staked it out on our sculpture trail. The the post frame of it is still there, and yeah. uh, maybe someday someone will come up with a hundred thousand dollars. It's an open air. Kind of, he called it the Chapel of Mosquitoes because when we're up there staking it out on the site, there were so many mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. But I, I also want to say that architecture is a driving force for this whole operation because, you know, I, every year I want to have one of the three shows is architecture because mm -hmm. architecture deserves a place in the arts and, and this world driven by. High capitalism has business mm -hmm. where, where the architectural offices are 300 people fighting kind of almost like a kind of land grab of real estate uh, happening in the architecture. And when I first came to New York, there were architecture galleries like Max Prote. There was an mm -hmm. architecture in urban space. There were great places to show architecture. Now there's none, you know, except for MoMA. You know, and yeah. that's one of that was one of the drugs of TAs. I mean, that's just my my own personal belief that architecture is an art and that it should be shown in that context in the synthesis of the arts. So every year we have an architecture with the, one of the three shows is architecture. 
Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's what storefront for art and architecture uh, was about. And it's continued to do that. But you're absolutely right. It's not in the commercial art world. And uh, we should think about ways to deploy that and promote the idea itself. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Can we see the next, maybe? Yeah. Here it is. George. Yeah, George. Where are you, George? Can you sort of mention and talk about this poetry commission here? Well, it was fantastic thing because I, I don't do commissions normally. I don't write that way on occasion, but it happened. It, it, it sort of spontaneously emerged because it was the spirit of this whole event with, with Stephen and, and, and Susan and, and the others that we would respond to each other's work. And so it was, it was an amazing occasion to be able to respond to Jose's um, incredible work. And uh, I felt a sort of bond happening because I think that's actually what happens in these kinds of events in which the arts mix is that you, you create a sense of um, mind connection. There's an absorption of alternate possibilities that happen. So I suddenly found myself writing architectural poetry. So something that I considered architectural poetry, which probably was something different from what anybody else would think that to be. And I think that's what's supposed to happen in these kinds of occasions, that they create the opportunity to actually make something different from what you would ordinarily do. And I, I think that's what Stephen and I talked about for years, even before uh, T-Space, that um, the Hudson Valley in particular is the place in which you have a, a tremendous variety of people and, uh, and kinds of artists and poets and, and, and composers. And you need something like T-Space and this kind of occasion to, uh, to, to catalyze the interaction of those energies that alter the actual language of, of art and, and poetry when they happen. Susan? Can we have the next slide, please? Um, so, so we can go through a couple slides. Uh, this is, but let's wait for one second. This is uh, Richard Archwager's show. He was one of our uh, one of our first shows. I think he was the third show. Um, we were thrilled that he he would show with us. Um, it, and you know, he was one of our people in the Hudson Valley who who you know gathered around tea space and around these ideas. Uh, next slide. Um, another one of our early, uh, you know, Martin Purrier was another one of our early uh, exhibitions, and he is part of the Hudson Valley and part of our community. Um, when we asked him to um, to ex exhibit, he said, "I have the perfect piece. Mm. This this is it, Vessel, and now it's at, in the Smithsonian collection. I saw it there a couple of years ago, but mm. um, he talked about." that putting it in the space, it, it just married with the architecture so mm. perfectly. It was like the architecture was made for it and vice versa, very special. He said, putting it together, there was like a, a, a ship in the bo a bottle. And he also said it was the most intimate show that he'd ever had. I mean, I think that, you know, this, that the, you know, Stephen was talking about architecture and we do one architecture show a year, which we, um, which we travel because there's a real lack of, of our, you know, architecture shows that are, are serious and, and yeah. really compelling. Um, but the artists, uh, you can go continue the slides. The artist uh, at T-Space, here's Carolee Schneemann. She was also a, a great um, fan of T-Space and, and, you know, dear person in the community. And she wanted to show um, this piece. It's uh, moving. Uh, it's a moving piece, uh, one of her moving pieces, and uh, with a video of the fire uh, that was used in the casting of the piece. Uh, continue, please. Mm -hmm. So, so this was um, Pat Steer's amazing show. She she's done floating lines um, iterations all over the world, and she actually was at Richard Tuttle's opening and, and came up to Stephen and I and said, "I want to show here next year." So, of course, we were absolutely thrilled but I think that the art what I was saying about the architecture is that you know there's so few pieces places to see art where the light and the space and the proportion fine proportions are 
um, so great that that is what, you know, really in part what draws people there. Her work also was a synthesis of, you know, really architecture and painting as she very mathematically figured out the, the shapes of the, the, the floating lines in order so that when you're in the space, that the painting of the lines come out in, at, to the viewer into the space. Um, next. Stephen, do you wanna talk about Neil Denari's? This is Neil Denari's, one of the great uh, Los Angeles architects. You know, he, he moved from LA and uh, has a practice and teaches at SciArc. And I asked him to show a tea space, can you make something special? And he really did. He put together all of his visionary projects into a kind of city. And uh, it's really, it was a fa fascinating. And this, and then the, those are all original drawings. He made this case, the design of this case. And those are all of his original drawings. And then the wall pieces. And we did a beautiful catalog. And this traveled to about five different venues after, after this. So th this is one of my missions is to make architecture exhibitions that are about ideas and about drawing and about the art of architecture. And this was a huge success because Neil followed this around. It went to Cleveland. I don't know how many cities it went to, but it was a traveling show and we launched it here at T-Space. Amazing. I can, I can see my friend Joe Mashak there, the author of- Arnold Oh yeah. Yes. yes. Right. And and yeah. Uh-huh. Terrific. Amazing. So this, this is a, go ahead, Stephen. This is Ricky Albenda from Andrew Krebs Gallery. Mm -hmm. And Ricky, you know, built this out of bamboo in the space. It took him about three weeks or something like that. I mean, he was working day and night. A very, very delicate thing that, that warps perspective. And it's a very experiential thing. You can put your head inside of it. And it's just an amazing sculpture suspended but it's about space it's about the warping of space and but all made out of organic bamboo materials handmade by him and uh, we it, it was so beautiful it was actually it was in the new york times it was there was a review in the new york times that 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 spoke about the new art going on in the hudson valley and uh, this was the image they used well one of these images yeah amazing Susan, you were saying something. Um, well, um, one, you can go to the next slide. One thing that we, I'll talk about this, this work. I think it's the last um, work that we have of the gallery, but this is Anthony Titus. This show um, went up um, last summer and um, we, it's, it's an amazing show. Anthony is a young um, artist. Um, as who's also an architect. And he really was deeply um, moved by our synthesis of the arts uh, concept. What he sort of the, S, the uh, seed for the show came out of um, one of Richard Wright's haikus, uh, mm -hmm. the best work that he did in his life, uh, Richard Wright. And Anthony was also inspired by, um, well, he, he dealt with the relationship between these um, wall pieces and the architecture um, throughout in a very um, powerful experiential way. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, at the opening um, at last summer, we were it, we had um, uh, a couple, Erica Peck and uh, uh, Dan playing uh, Anthony Braxton music in the gallery. It was it was a beautiful collaboration. I did want to mention that um, we also do um, brochures for most of our shows, and we have wonderful um, uh, writers. We've had Sanford Quinter has did an amazing, has done like two or three incredible um, essays for us, one for Terry Winters, one for um, an interview with Agneska Courant that was incredible. Anyway, there's, um, Barbara Rose has written for us, a, a lot of people. And um, we have, 
I guess this is a little plug, but we have um, all of our catalogs on our website, so you can purchase them for a very tiny sum. Um, but they're they're wonderful, really wonderful documents. Um, you can go to the next slide. That's wonderful to keep the archives. Yes, yes, we have a very, very good archive in that way. And we'll talk later, Irene, you'll talk more about our digital platform and our digital archive, which we're really growing. So this, this is the last of our um, slides about the exhibitions. Here's Cedar, Cedar Sego. Um, he did a beautiful reading. He came from the West Coast, along with Oscar Toison, whose piece is in the background there. Um, and Oscar and and Cedar are very close collaborators, and um, uh, that was a, a very beautiful collaboration. Oscar did a show in the gallery as well as this um, outdoor piece, which we moved to our re reserve. We'll have a uh, uh, slide of that. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So so every year we you know poetry is so important to T Space, and starting in two thousand thirteen. Um, uh, we, I actually, it was George and Stephen that had put their minds together and, and hatched this idea of giving a poetry award out. And the poet comes and reads at T-Space uh, that year. So we've had a, a wonderful number of people read, uh, very memorable. And this year, in our 10th year, special 10th year, we've um, given it to George Quasha. So we're very, very proud of that. And um, uh, it's about time. <laughs> well, George is actually, I might add that he's done a lot of projects for us. He's written at least two essays, um, one very memorable one for Carolee Schneemann. He's uh, read his poetry a few times. He did uh, at least one performance um, with music um, that I remember in the gallery. I think there was one outside too. So, but it is, I think it's very special in our 10th year to be able to yep. um, honor George. Um, and I, oh, I, I just wanna mention also on our archive, on our website, we have um, the readings, um, the audio of the readings of all of, all of our poets. Mm -hmm. um, not only of the poetry award winners, but it, since we have three shows a year, we have, many, many uh, poets um, uh, and musicians um, on, on our website. So let's go to the next slide. Amazing. So I'm gonna give it over to Stephen now. Do you wanna talk? Okay, this is, this is, this is a, a site plan and you can see Round Lake up in the right hand corner. And Round Lake is, is a 10 or more year old ice block basin lake with an incredible ecology. Mm -hmm. um, wetlands around almost three quarters of the lake undisturbed or organically fed by seven, 17 uh, stream of springs. This, this lake, the water is so pure in this lake, they were going to take the water for Rhinebeck, town of Rhinebeck back in 1840. And then the city fathers decided to take it from the Hudson River instead. I'm glad of that. But anyway, on the left-hand side, you see tea space on the right-hand side, the little T right in the middle by our house. That's where we live and there's tea space but on the left side you see a, a 30 acre now it's a reserve and that was going to be a five house subdivision and it's a long story but i bought it for half of what they were asking and joined all the properties together so that they could never make a subdivision and there's only one house and that's the x of in house in the experimental house and there's a sculpture <laughs> trail so the entire thing is a is a Ecology Reserve. Next slide. This is Round Lake, which has this incredible natural lily pads and lotus blossoms. It's almost like a Zen retreat to go down there. Uh, it's very amazing. Next slide. And when we when we wanted to do something with that 30 acres, um, I didn't know what to do and I wanted knew I wanted to form into one preserve and not let it be a five house subdivision. But what we did was we commissioned Robert Kelly to write a poem. That was our first act. And this is just a, an excerpt from, from his poem. What we do with land, what can we do? Map those acres of the sky. 
to offer this land to heaven and see what comes. This thing wants art. What is art? Art is doing for the first time what was never done. Art is the completion of the unbegun. So then we were going to, we decided to, we're going to make one house in the middle of this forced and rocky outcropping nat natural, natural preservation. Mm -hmm. Just one house, very compact, condensed, geothermally heated and cooled, almost net zero solar. Um, done with organic materials and we're making it as an experimental house. So it was the intersection of four spheres mm -hmm. in space and how they could impose themselves on the house. Next. Amazing. And there was, we even made a manifesto. Dimitri, my wife and I made a manifesto of what we're going to, what, what are we going to try to do with explorations of in as a house to study architecture freed from the purely objective from origins of architecture, explore in, mm -hmm. in all space is sacred space. The architecture of in dominates space via space. Intrinsic in is an elemental force of sensual beauty. In is useless, but in the future will be used. Purpose finds in. The thinking is not the thing contained. So we did it. We built this house without any bedrooms at all, by the way. Mm -hmm. But it sleeps five people, right? And, and now I'm happy to say because of Demetra, my wife is so smart. Can you go to the next slide? Wow. You know, one of the problems with being, you know, being so culturally or organized and oriented is you have to figure out how to make it work. How do you sustain this situation? And she put this on Airbnb. And what? it's this house is supporting all the property taxes for all of T-Space property. Amazing. And it's booked, it's booked up months in advance and it's already on the top of the Airbnb list. And the interesting thing is, it was not pragmatically made at all. It, I mean, it was geothermal, it's geothermally heated and cooled and all of that with organic pour over recycled glass and wood, or natural wood. But there was no effort to make, you know, a suburban thing. There's no bedrooms in this house. Yeah. It's big five in different layers and different places. But the thing that's really <laughs> strange is everybody wants to stay here and it's booked all the time in the middle of this forest and it just became the basically the engine that allows us to we you know kind of exist in terms of taxes because it's you know when you have this much property it's a 5013c our whole operation mm -hmm. by the way but we haven't been able to get the tax abatement for the, the 30 acres from the town of Rhinebeck because they're angry because they lost their five house subdivision tax roll right so yeah that's the that's the problem of you can be ecologically minded and try to save the land from suburban tract, but this, the little town, you know, boards have their different, you know, everybody is about money. Anyway, we're, we're through that problem because this gets Airbnb. So when you come here to Airbnb, this you're supporting T-Space. That's great. So it's, it's a potential um, visitors, I will bring their, I guess, sleeping bag with them. <laughs> no, no, there's bed, there's bedding. No, no it's, it's okay, completely, no, no, it's okay. just, there's no bedrooms. There's beds, sheets, okay. it's a real Airbnb. You can look on it an Airbnb, it has like five stars. There's a lady that takes care of it and she does a perfect job, Sarah, so. That's great. Well, I like the, uh, the, the notion of sensual beauty in the manifesto. So yes. that's the key word. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. Absolutely. Next slide. Don't play this, was, this is. Next slide. Do we have another slide? That's the opening. That was the opening. Um, I believe it was in 2016, where wow. at that point we thought this was going to be the guest cottage for the artists whenever they came to put their work up at T Space. And that's my wife, Demetra, who's the genius. She's a registered architect and she's reading, she's, uh, you know, making the announcements at the opening. And, but then we realized that it makes more sense to Airbnb it. So it's occupied all the time. Amazing. What a beautiful interior. It's all, all these spheres intersect. 
acting right. That's all natural wood too. There's no, um, you know, sort of paints or oils. Or it's all organic. The, the windows are made out of solid mahogany. The stairs are made out of solid mahogany with no, no stains or any kind of, it's all organic, the whole thing. And it's the geothermal heating makes this house enormously, you know, in the wintertime, really wonderful because the floors are warm, you know, so. Yeah. It's interesting thinking back from having seen Morton per years, uh, peas. It seems it's, it, it, it's emerged out of the wooden floor into the wooden structure. <laughs> <laughs> and the same, Maybe. yeah, and the same you can say about this interior that overformed how it's put together. Uh, in spite of the impeccable design, it seemed very sensual. Yes, very. Materially, too. Yeah, amazing. We'll invite you to come and stay if I can find a a day that it's not already booked. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'd yeah. be willing. Would, would be a, a pleasure. And this was a this this was an old hunting shack that was on the site, the center portion. And I I, I made two end pieces and some skylights, and made it into the interns, the fellowship studio for the students when they come here and they work. Next, beautiful. That that that's. That also has no plumbing or heating. Uh, it's just a tar paper, you know, transformation of an existing hunting shack. But it's a perfect place for the summer interns to work. And now during COVID, I've actually turned it into my studio temporarily. Wonderful. Wow. Next. Next slide. So the interior is all natural light, mm. and all organized by golden section proportions and just a great place to work in the natural light. Mm. Amazing. And then next slide. So there's an existing cottage on a piece of land next door, a 1.5 acre piece of land next door that actually came up uh, on auction and, and uh, somebody tipped me off. It would had been vacant. You can see it down there on the left and uh, 1940 cottage. And uh, anyway, it we, we got it for a dollar more than the bank. It, the, the bank was auctioning it because it, the taxes hadn't been paid in several years. So once we had that, we decided to build my archive building, move my archive, all my architectural models were in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and mm -hmm. we decided to build an archive building and move the entire archive up here so it could be part of the T-space. Next. Oh, yeah. So there you see, actually, that's where we are right now. And that, that building is 3,000 square feet, and it's geothermally heated and cooled by a single well, 500 feet deep with a new technology of bundled um, instead of open loop, closed loop. Anybody mm -hmm. that knows about geothermal, I've done more than more than 20 geothermal well projects. But now we, for this one, I was the engineer myself because I didn't want to overdo it. We didn't have any money. Actually, I did this <laughs> structural engineering and the HVAC. And I'm really uh, excited together with Eric that helped me that this is actually working so perfectly. It'll be zero degrees outside and it's a perfect 70 degrees with a radiant floor, one geothermal well. So there's no, you know, I mean, as an example for what is it, what's the difference between geothermal and uh, oil heat? That cabin that this is attached to on yeah. the left, that 1940 cabin cost a thousand dollars a month in January and February to, to make the oil heat furnace work. This building costs forty dollars a month to to pay the water furnace electricity dollars a month. And it's completely, you know, without any other. There's no maintenance. So once you decide to do geothermal, of course you've got to dig the well. That was fourteen thousand dollars. But once you've done that, you're you're there forever, and it's it's a perfect system because it cools in the summer and heats in the winter. I think it's the future, really, especially for this region. 
Mm -hmm. It also works in Beijing. I did the largest geothermal installation, 660 wells, 100 meters deep in Beijing, that's still operating on uh, 240 apartments. So geothermal really, in terms of ecology and the future, is, I think, one of the most underestimated potentials we have. Of course, we know about solar and wind, but mm -hmm. in the climates, the climates that work, geothermal is, is superb. There's inside the archive. Yeah. That's where all my models from all the years, all the way back to 1979 or 80, they're, they're yeah. chronologically arranged. And, that, and then there's an architectural library with a lot of volumes that, that's going to be opened by appointment. Um, for Bard, Bard uh, College has started an architectural program. I think there's 12 students now. So they've been up here uh, visiting. So there'll be, you know, there's the, an architecture world here of uh, the archive building as part of T-Space. Beautiful. And that's open to the public occasionally? By too? appointment. By appointment, By yes. Yeah. yeah. Great. Terrific. So, and that's, Susan, you want to talk about that? I'll talk about the installation trail. So um, yeah. I will, I wanted to answer your question, Fawn. Um, Fawn. It's, um, we are now doing uh, everything you've seen and will see on the T-Space campus is available to tour. We're doing a really deep dive into the art, architecture and landscape um, ecology. Uh, and it's very educational too for uh, both, both architecture students and, and the general public. Um, the guided tours can be booked um, on our website. And we're doing them um, all summer long. Um, we're doing them, you know, pretty much. Uh, you can book a tour anytime. We can arrange it with a with a tour guide. Um, we there's this thing called Upstate Art Weekend. We're going to be open all three days: Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, July twenty third, twenty second, twenty third, twenty fourth. And we'll be doing tours, you know, all day long for those three days. Anyway, so so we're now. Um, this was the opening of the of the reserve um, where I, Eva Batova led the audience down the trail um, with a performance. Um, next slide. She actually went. She went uh, to. Never mind. Okay, so um, so I'm going to talk about the Richard Nonis piece that we have. It's very very. We're just so so moved and happy that Richard worked with us in 2018. Um, he, mm -hmm. he started um, at the Exavin house and he ended uh, this 900 foot line at the edge of the property. It's 80 cross beams uh, that go through the dips and the rises of the, of the forest. Um, Richard says that the, the simplest most clear form of a man-made intervention in nature is the straight line. Mm -hmm. and, you know, before he was an artist, he was an anthropologist, and you know that left such um, a big imprint on his um, sculptural practice. And you know, it it changes the forest enormously. It becomes like this emotionally charged kind of place of um, about space and place that is really beautiful. Um, we do have a trail that you can walk on that that you you saw in the in the map, but people are so intrigued by this piece and it it marks the land in such a way that that they've made sort of a trail along the along just for people walking there along the piece. It's very beautiful. Um, the title refers to a place. It's called Where None, and mm -hmm. from back at uh, Worst Word Ho, a place where none. Um, yeah, it's, it's really worth a pilgrimage. It's, it's so moving to have this. Can we have the next slide? So this is the Oscar Toison piece that you saw um, with where, where Cedar Seagull was, was um, reading adjacent to it. Um, it's called Tent. Um, it, you know, Oscar's work is, you know, do it yourself. It has like a very provisional kind of quality to it. Um, it, it, addresses the landscape as well as brings the viewer in for, you know, a place of performance or rest. Um, we're, it's wonderful in all seasons. We're very, very happy with this, this piece. Oscar, Oscar, 
Go ahead. Oscar w worked as an architect. Um, you know, his work really bridges architecture and sculpture. And uh, he worked for my close friend, Vito Acconci, who I did storefront with. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's that fusion, that sort of, let's say, blurring the fuzzy edges between art and architecture, I think is so important that we, we acquired this Oscar Tuzan piece that he made for us and then moved it to the center, the center of the sculpture trail. So when you walk that trail, it takes you about 45 minutes, I think, to walk the trail, but this is a kind of halfway point. You can stop and in case it's raining, wait for the rain to end. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, it's interesting because of Chris Burden's recent published book of his Unreal Life project, Many sketches, Stephen, Susan, are really uh, 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 ideas where he's trying to infuse sculpture and architecture. Right. It's so interesting. Uh, also, Vito Acconci, you know. Oh, Vito, very, pioneer yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yes. And Tony Smith. I mean, it would be really interesting to do a show sometime about unrealized projects of artist architects. Um, yeah. Can we have the next slide? So I'm gonna hand it over to Irini um, to talk about this piece. She was one of the artists um, in who created it. So Irini. Sure, thank you. Yes, I, I happily talk very briefly about it, which is currently installed at the trail. Um, the piece is called Sustainability, which is kind of the work that uh, we do as, uh, as, as an architect crossing between media and art. Uh, so this piece is uh, talking about sustaining and releasing energy. Uh, the focus is on materiality and my background as an architect is in shaping materials uh, such as steel in the case it's a hollow steel tube. It's very, very, very heavy each, but very highly malleable and flexible. Um, I would like to maybe switch to talking a little bit about the residency program uh, as I'm heavily involved with the educational project uh, programs uh, as the director of those programs at uh, T Space, mm -hmm. and I'm going to take on uh, the screen here for a moment. It's a 25 day intensive. It happens once a year, uh -huh. and we uh, have uh, a series of residents, five or six per year, who uh, join that program, which is funded by donors, and it's a scholarship program that makes it possible for very young. Uh, professionals or undergraduates or graduate students to join um, without any tuition. So the scholarship program is really, really beautiful and growing. Um, and it affords everyone the opportunity to do, uh, to take part in this. In mm -hmm. the next slide, we see those uh, residents in action. We see the um, making of physical models. Uh, the program is very heavily focused on physical making. Um, and uh, so what the materials we work with is white paper, in this case, light and space. And residents are trying to really develop an original language, an original response uh, to the themes that are being introduced. And there is a broad range of um, speakers that contribute to this conversation. We've initiated our lecture series back in 2019, and it's growing, uh, and there are beautiful uh, in, uh, people from practicing architects, artists, cultures, photographers, editors, philosophers, writers who contribute to this conversation and really try to open up uh, the debate. And it's really our residents who run the show. They, um, uh, they're panelists, uh, they are uh, running the, the conversation and the themes that they're discussing very frequently revolve around uh, topics such as the rural compression or transformation of consciousness or cosmic dust is one thing that uh, we uh, return to and explore um, in this program. So the residents try to draw connections across fields and experiment and I'm going to share one uh, example here of a resident from 2017. Her name is uh, Ashley. Morgan, and she was inspired by the poem by Robert Kelly, one excerpt that she drew from is the following, I'll read it for you. The light became a line, 
that stretched a goal across a golden boundary. And in response, Ashley in her own words says, inhabiting that line of light as it curves and shapes chambers of space. And this is how she creates um, this architecture. And we see here a work of other residents who really, um, what we see is, is buildable architecture that considers abstraction, where there's great need for abstraction is, is a need and, and not a luxury. Uh, we see urgency a love uh, to study architecture beyond the object, to study it with inspiration as a motivating force and to design with and for nature. So there, the program is, is truly a um, thought provoking uh, and, and thinking about the pro pro and provoking conversation and debate and critical thinking in addition to experimental design. And um, with that, I can move on to uh, the future programming and look into um, the season that's coming up now in the summer with pamphlet architecture uh, being one of those shows uh, opening in September. So pamphlet uh, architecture, for those who may not know, um, I'm very, very grateful to be co-curating that show with Steve Pullimon. And the pamphlet architecture is an experimental platform which allows for new voices to emerge, really ground up. It allows for alternative points of views to be heard. Uh, the author is the editor for the pamphlet and uh, giving up this editorial control, I think pamphlet uh, architecture really allows for the author to um, express their original voice with authenticity. The only constraint is the seven by eight and a half format where all the images and text uh, have to fit in that format. So the theme for pamphlet architecture 37 is experiments and visions in architecture. And it asks questions, for example, how do we look into the future while preserving the landscape? How do we imagine new light, air and spatial energy? How do we design new architecture for new consciousness? And so this year there were four uh, prizes awarded uh, for um, the participants who will be exhibiting their work alongside other ephemera for pamphlet architecture. So we're looking to the history of architecture from the pamphlet architecture, but also the future of it. Um, and how, you know, this experimental platform has really gone through different uh, generations of experimentation and how um, it is, it can be done today in this uh, digital age. How can we support really debate um, and dialogue in an era that is very much oversaturated? And I think pamphlet architecture, as well as three space and the residency program, they do provide a very focused ground uh, where these ideas can be deeply discussed. They can be analyzed, hypothesized, but also contextualized and I find that this, this um, is a kind of urgent need uh, to do in, in our uh, oversaturated environment. Wonderful. So continuing um, the what's happening um, this year, um, we're very excited to open um, a Susan Freecon exhibition um, June 5th. Uh, you can come visit it. Um, this, we're in Susan's studio, which is all lit by natural light. Um, the large painting behind her uh, called Brushwood Hematite Bancha will be exhibited uh, uh, in the main space along with four smaller works. And um, Susan's work is, uh, and tea spades are, you know, distinctly suited for each other, um, both the, the paintings of Susan's and the gallery are, you know, constructed with the proportions of the golden section and uh, the abundant natural light and space are just, um, her work is, you know, very multidimensional in, in, uh, in the light um, and with a, like a unique optical reality where the, the painting seems to come out into the space. I think that's going to, she's very excited. She feels that that will be um, just a perfect place for, um, for her work. And um, she's keeping the paintings and the architecture in uh, a beautiful equilibrium. Um, we're pairing her 
her uh, paintings with, uh, and then the next, the next artist we have is Arlene Sheckett, um, opening July 17th. And it's really wonderful. Arlene is not only doing an exhibition in the gallery, uh, an installation, but is doing two outdoor installations for us, one on the grounds of tea space and one on our tea space reserve. And uh, on, the in on the installation trail, she has uh, found a place, a very magical location um, past, just past Arthur um, Oscar's piece that um, she's gonna be working with. Um, both of these artists um, shows will be um, have like an intergenerational dial interdisciplinary dialogue with um, the poetry in Arlene's case of um, Maggie Milner. Um, both Arlene's work deals with the idea of couplets and doubling and um, Maggie's has a new book coming out on couplets and the music also um, on will epstein will deal with this uh theme so um that is that's what we have coming up this summer and uh, along with the pamphlet architecture show um another project we're working very hard on is um the Estra Zarina um book um republication mm -hmm. um, on the left is our exhibition rome and the teacher Estra Zarina about this important yet under-recognized uh, female ar architect and educator. Um, MIT will republish this 1970s book, a very important book, uh, Itetti di Roma. It's on public first urban design, um, which of course we need to be thinking about now more than ever. Uh, the book translates her writings that are paired with the wonderful photographs of Balthazar Korab um, of the rooftops and public spaces of, of Rome. Um, I'll also mention that we have, have uh, a little plug. Um, we've, um, we have donations for three quarters of the amount of funds needed for the book, just a quarter to go. So please consider supporting this worthy project. Um, and uh, for the next slide, what do we have? Um, so, you know, we're looking ahead to the 2023 season um, and uh, on the right, we, we're going to have an NEA supported Anne Hamilton show and is actually coming uh, to T-Space this summer for a, a site visit. It's going to be a very deep collaboration between the architecture, between the poetry, uh, the, between Anne Lauterbach, who she's wanted to collaborate with for years and printmakers. Um, that local printmakers. Um, she actually is an artist in residence. She will be staying in the ex of in-house. So we do have artists staying there when we are able to. And um, we're really excited about this interdisciplinary project with Anne. Um, Tor Kwase Dyson, um, we are thrilled to be able, that she's gonna be working with us, that she'll, we're gonna do a commission of um, paintings and sculpture uh, called Black Compositional Thought Compound Curve, um, bringing her in special um, interdisciplinary mix to, um, to T-Space that includes not only her art and architecture of her work and as well as the poetry of Ronaldo uh, Wilson and, um, and movement and her theories on Black co compositional thought. And this, um, year, the 2023 will be the first year where we are um, working on with community education outreach. Um, so I think, um, is there another slide? Ah, yes. So um, we, we wanted to say thank you to our amazing donors. Um, we couldn't do it without you. We're, we're so blessed and um, we're, you know, our very special donors, Jeffrey Brown and Elise Jaffe, I wanted to give a shout out. They're um, passionate and, and about architecture and art, and they've been with us for um, many years, and we're, we're very grateful to them and, and all of our donors. Um, so I think that, um, Stephen, did you want to say anything, or that, that wraps up the visuals, and then we can go back to Fong and, and 
and chat some more. We can open to questions, yes. No, well, let, let me, yeah, thank you. This is terrific. Thank you for the amazing presentation. And as Stephen mentioned earlier about the resistance to be separated from one to the other discipline, you know, so in a way, the idea of traditional subdivision of the art, the so-called seven art was, you're absolutely right. It's sculpture, painting, literature, music, performance, film, and architecture. That was the seven idea, the seven art. In fact, uh, right. between 1916 and 17, even though it's one year, 10 copy were published, it was called the seven arts. Um, and that was super influential to how the philosophy of the broken rail uh, were created. Similarly, you know, it was one year, three people got involved, the poets, um, James Oppenheim, Waldo Frank and Van Wyck Brooks. Uh, and it really, really had a profound influence on how I thought about things. And which bring to mind, I like to ask a few questions in regard to that idea because I wonder when the beginning, when you all were thinking about it, the early formation of how it's gonna get started, was there any affinity towards other organism in previous history? I was thinking, of course, the shared philosophy, uh, since you are an architect, trained an architect. Uh, I was thinking the Bauhaus, you know, the Bauhaus in, in a tree existing location, uh, it lasted 14 years only. I mean, we tend to forget about that. And then when uh, basically it was forced to stop by the Nazi, you know, by, by Nazi Germany, it sort of somehow create a new, the, new shape and form in a different continuation, meaning the founding of Black Mountain College. And yes, Black Mountain, Black Mountain, George Kwasha has deep connections to Black Mountain. So Black Mountain was definitely a spiritual a, a precursor. I mean, in a different way, but I mean, because times have changed and we have, we are, our priorities are more about the synthesis of the arts, but I think there is, I mean, George, you could speak, the, 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 you could speak to your connections to Black Mountain, George. Absolutely. Um, obviously, the poets, uh, Robert Duncan and Charles Olson, and then, of course, John Cage, who we published, we published, uh, I have published all those poets and different um, and writers in, in different combinations. Black Mountain really was on our minds when we first came to the Hudson Valley in the 70s and founded the Artem Feeney Arts Center, which had all of the arts. We funded through government grants, uh, 46, I think, 47 different artists, poets, composers, all kinds of uh, artists, dancers, and presented those programs. That was the, the root of our being there. And Stational Press, of course, emerged out of that and published all of those arts uh, in one form or another. So actually, yes. And then when you and I started talking about doing things together and, and, and other possibilities for the Hudson Valley, that was the model that we talked most about, wasn't it? Right. In fact, I think John Cage was your first um, connection yeah, with John, us. Yeah, John, I lived next door to John Cage when I first moved to New York in 1977, 78, 79. And, you know, I ran into him a few times. But, I mean, he, you know, I'm from the Pacific Northwest, from, you know, Cornish School of Art is where John Cage in Seattle is where John Cage met Merce Cunningham. I mean, those two characters are about the synthesis of the arts, right? Absolutely. Music, dance, poetry, painting. Absolutely. John Cage and Merce Cunningham, you know, that's a spiritual force. And, you know, I mean, we, you know, by, by the way, John Cage's archive is up here in the Hudson Valley now, right, George? Right. It's at Bard, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, Gary Hill was at Cornish also, which is interesting, uh, one of our main collaborators over the years. The but I, I just want to say something about doing this and not knowing where you're going to go. Yeah. Is, is an experiment. I, I didn't think that, I thought I could ask certain people and they wouldn't, you know, be, you know, they would say, no, I wait, wait said yes immediately. And I'm sorry, Susan didn't put in pictures of what he did, a fantastic exhibition. And I asked him, I said, hi, what, what, what do you think is in? He said, well, I like that nothing is for sale and you're forming a community. Mm -hmm. That was his notion of what our mission is, is about forming a community of like minds that interact. And 
he was a, an amazing con a contributor very early on. I mean, I thought if I asked him, he would say no, but on the contrary, you know, and, and that was like, it was like that with, I don't think anybody ever turned down an in invitation to show a tea space, you know, and nothing is for sale. I mean, what's the motivation? The motivation is idealism. In fact, maybe the motivation is that nothing is for sale. Yeah, no, that's super true. Uh, yeah, it's hard to imagine, but Black Mountain College lasted only 24 years, you know, it was created yeah. 33 and it closed in 57. When you mentioned about uh, Charles Olson, Charles mm -hmm. Olson, Olson became the second rector when Albert left for Yale to create the graduate school, uh, you know, art and architecture there. So it really, that's where the whole Black Mountain Review magazine were created. And I love that whole idea where a poet and an artist can collaborate. In such I, th I think it's important to say that it's not just the arts that have the influence as such. Yeah. It's the state of mind in the way that they come together and operate in the place. And I think that's important in, in, in T-Space. And it was always important for how we thought of projects, that this, is a, a, this is, affects how language operates, how mind operates. And it really, in that sense, it's political because it creates the way a self-regulating community can operate yeah. through mutual influence and collaboration. You know, yeah. Evolution is not about survival, it's about collaboration, really. Yeah. It's most yeah. of what, what living organisms do. Yeah. And that's the, the basis of an actual community is that it learns to spontaneously and naturally collaborate. Yes. Art, art's the only model around that allows that to occur. Yeah. And, and one last question before we, we open up to the Q&A. Um, this go to Arini and Susan, if you don't mind. Um, so has the public programming bringing together all this cross-pollinated uh, collaboration with musicians, poets, artists, um, that, that been increasingly more, I would say, uh, visible and available to the public community nearby. That's including, you know, underserved community also. You cut out a little bit. Um, could you just repeat the question? I, I didn't. Yeah. How has the, the, the robust effort that in terms of creating what's available, the mm -hmm. cross pollination of all the visual art and the spoken words and music and whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. How's that ha has how's that has reached a certain critical welcoming to the community surrounding? And I'm interested in also underserved community. Have they known about T space, and and how did you know how did that fit into the whole grand writing? Because Stevens, you know, and you talk about early on, it's like self-sustaining as a nonprofit is an ongoing challenge. So we, one had to be more inventive in ways to work in every way <laughs> to, yeah. to make sure that the self-sustaining is the key. It's not so much looking forward to the, the forever so, future. Fong, how do you do it? How do you do the Brooklyn Rail? How do you do it? You we know, need to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, it's very simple for us. It's a constant struggle. It's a chronic urgency. Yeah. You know, I think ones have to go back, but I'd really love to hear what you say too. I mean, I always admire the notion that I hunger, therefore the object becomes food. It's not because <laughs> food lays before me that drives my hunger. And I think artists, true artists, true poets, true writers, any true creative individual thrive on that condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so we we based on that philosophy, and it's been 21 years now, and uh, Brooklyn Rail, yeah, Brook 20, wow, yes. But we're now reaching a very uh, you know critical readership, nearly three million on the on the web. So that's that is definitely have its own momentum, and I believe that when former President Trump used that deploy that term social distance and is exactly that manipulated um, phrase or psychology that's been 
so overwhelmingly um, affected in the last several decades. So what we are doing is social intimacy. We are bringing people together, but still the whole idea of sustaining is very interesting. So I'm just saying, I, we at the rail are struggling to maintain that without losing our cosmic optimism and our commitment to do what we do culturally. But I'm just saying, my question to you all is that it's been what, you started in 2010? Mm -hmm. So at least 12 years, that's significant. That's 12 long years. Uh, and, and so my question is like, how do you see it growing? And how do you deal, mediate with that self-sustaining? Um, I, I don't think the idea of bigness is an appropriate value. I think that the Museum of Modern Art is a great example of why that kind of a value system goes wrong. You know, the Museum of Modern Art was once an intimate place. You could see art, you could, you felt a certain, I don't know, a kind of mystery. Now it's all elbows and, you know, get out of the way and there's too many people and it's a disgusting experience. It's too big. So, you know, I'm not, I, I would just speak for, you know, a certain uh, reflective existential questioning on the value of bigness. Look what's done to the culture of architecture. Everybody, every firm has to be 300 or 500 people. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no sense of intimacy in the detailing or in the experience of the buildings that they produce. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I don't want to go into that, but to me, uh, there's, there's an importance in scale. And mm -hmm. I would like someone else, actually, I'm working on a project called Z Space in Pound Ridge by two wonderful people that have a lot more money than we do that really want to do this. And that's what I would encourage. I don't think T-Space should get bigger at all. I don't think it should, that whole value is wrong. What, what should happen is in another community to like start a, like, a likewise uh, operation. And they're very excited about it. And I'm, I'm doing the building for them, the Demetra. And I, in fact, my wife, Demetra Zacharelia brought that commission to us. And uh, they said, would you be interested in making a project like T-Space for us in Pound Ridge? And I said, of course, this is the excitement, Pong. Not, not to grow bigger, but to actually take the idea and put, make, make some other people do their own communities. And I think that's much more important. This idea of that everything has yeah. to get bigger, I think is, that's what's killed the Museum of Modern Art. You know, I mean, it's a... Yeah, not too much. Sorry, sorry not Glenn, if you're listening, Glenn Howard. <laughs> It's okay. He's gonna, he's gonna listen to it, and he'll he'll hear your. He knows. Response. He knows. I'm only, you know, one of his thorns in his side. <laughs> Not to mention the carpet when you walk into the old MoMA. It's minimized noise. You remember? Yes. And there's no more. No, I loved it, and the wonderful, you know, Philip Johnson stair. At least they saved that, and they saved the garden. But you know, I mean, it's uh, it just yeah. Well, that's another story. Yes, I, I the longest say, story. But I just I think... to say that T space is an intimate experience. It remains that. And the interesting thing about the rail is that even though it has millions of viewers, it's intimate in the format of being online, which is one of the right. things about this pandemic situation is that it's created this kind of intimacy, which the rail maintains. Right. Yeah. right. Susan, you have yeah. some. I would say that we, you know, we learned something from the pandemic. And mm -hmm. I would say that we would increase our presence in this format. Because in this format, we don't have to buy wine for everybody and figure out where they go to the toilet. In this <laughs> format, we can have a con we can have a conversation. But T Space itself is an intimate place. Mm -hmm. We don't want more people to come there. Please. Yeah. Don't yeah. invite more people to come. That's not what we want. We want the dialogue, right? And, yeah. and uh, you know, I mean, we had, I don't know, 200 people there for Bryce Martin's show, and we had to, you know, get a bunch of porta potties and put them out on the lawn. I mean, that's not, that's not exciting. What's exciting are the ideas and the interchange. Yeah. And, and what's exciting is to hear what George Quasha is going to write. You know, he's going to make a new poem for this experimental architecture program exhibition with four young unknown artists that's happening in September 2nd. And George is gonna write something 
or maybe we'll commission a piece of music and see what that what that's exciting and then we can share it on the internet we can share it on our website yeah right? and uh i don't think i think it's it's not it's not a bigness or growing it that's right which is uh susan yeah i agree with that it's not about growing bigness i think it's deepening it. it's about deepening it's yeah. about deepening right. commitment. it's about deepening our synthesis and our education and you know our commitment to the ecology mm-hmm. i think um you know in terms of the dig- one thing like Stephen was saying is the pandemic has showed us our digital platforms have really gotten very strong the the the, the lectures that that Irini was talking about even our synthesis of the arts openings which are all online um that we did during the pandemic are mm-hmm. really, uh, great educational tools and i will say i mean no, you know, we do want people to visit. We have open hours. We want people to come and understand what, what's going on to be inspired. You know, we want, we, you know, we have open hours every Sunday from 11 to five and we really want people to come. And the tours are fantastic. They're very educational. I think what, you know, to, to kind of go to what another point of your question about the community is, you know, I mean, we, we do, do outreach to the community. And we have had, you know, young people from school, different schools, uh, you know, teens and, you know, it's, it's very inspiring, you know, to see kids um, uh, minds open by Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. art and architecture. And um, we are, you know, have applied for, for an NEA grant that will allow us in 2023 um, to, you know, really do an educational uh, community outreach. We have someone we have in mind who will be leading it. And, you know, we've been getting, uh, making connections and links now. We'll probably start some of it this summer. So that that is a really important aspect. And, you know, we're interested in people that ha- have diverse communities connecting with us and coming for tours and, you know, coming to see art. So I just wanted to mention that. No, it's perfect. Thank you. Um, Arena, any last word? The residents, the, the, the residents for the residency program, uh, you see whether it is uh, in person or online, uh, we hear things that the, this experience in time short is life transformative, mm-hmm. uh, be it online or not. And so I think that uh, that says exactly what this experience, how it can be felt intimately uh, through the experimentation and exploration that is going on in in the program through the energy that can be felt. I think we can feel it here now with Stephen's energy, Susan's and everybody, the, the excitement that comes in uh, to and to the work that goes into P-Space and all its programming. Yeah, thank you so much. I know that it's super true that we are capable of bringing warmth uh, against the cold form of technology, which is what we're doing here. So it's a form of amplifying social intimacy. And I agree with you, Stephen, because scale is psychological. Scale is not proportion. You can make big painting like Jackson Pollock, but his aspiration is to intensify the intimacy that are his, one of his, you know, master that he admires so much is Albert Bingham Ryder, who paint tiny painting that have a monumental present in scale. Um, so it is, you're right, it is psychological and it is scale that what make architect count in some way. It's not the bigness, not the spectacular. Spectacle of vision is not exactly what make culture. That's it. Thank you so much, you all. Uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Rini. Let's thank see if we can, uh, thank you, George. Also, let's see if we can uh, give it back to uh, Caroline and invite our friends to, to ask questions. Thank hey. you, Tom, and thank you, the Brooklyn Rail. It, it's just, it was really a delight. And we look forward to having all of you, everyone come and visit. Carolyn, thank you. Yes, thank you all so much. Um, we got a lot of questions. Um, so let's see, I would love to turn it to um, Hinava first to um, unmute. You should be able to, to ask your question. Um, hello. 
Yes. Um, so I have a question for um, Stephen Hall. So as an architect, how do you decide the spatial dimensions for different exhibition rooms in art museums? I think the spatial proportions and the natural light are the key, are really the key and often a forgotten dimension in making exhibition space. And I think the, one of the problems is I teach my students and I tell them, please don't use computer drawings, you know, because they're, they're, they're not giving you what is true proportions. Build models and photograph the models in natural light. And that's how I designed. That's how I've done over 10 museums. And T-Space is not different. The models were built, natural light was studied on the inside, how it would work carefully thinking about proportions. And by the way, there's a, there's a proportional ratio that's the same of this joint to that joint to that joint, one to 1.618, golden ratio, if you want to call it that, is historic. You know, Phidias used it, Louis Sullivan used it, Lou Kahn used it, Le Corbusier, of course, he made the blue and brown series of the module, modular. I mean, you can, you can, and there's a wonderful, there's a wonderful uh, video about Mies van der Rohe done in 1986, a film done in 1986, where Mies is actually speaking. And at a certain moment, he said, proportion, architecture, proportion, you know? So <laughs> that's really the key. And, and you, you worry about how it feels, how the sequence of spaces can be aligned with each other. It's like a, it's like a piece of music. You move from one space, a perspective opens you into the next space. So, you know, I'm not, I think the, 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 this is a very good question because it's very complicated. Thank you. Thanks so much for that question. Thank you, Stephen. Um, let's see, next we'd love to turn it to our friend GE, but should we ask your question for you? If you're in the, okay. Um, so uh, GE's in a library um, and can't unmute, but he is curious, what other fusions can you envision for future programming of T-Space, theater, et cetera? Yes, well, I, we did a collaboration with Jessica Lang about dance, the music, dance, and we created the sets. And you can actually see that online called Tesseracts of Time. And uh, Demetra, my wife, was instrumental in the title and, and in the collaboration. And you can, I think you could look at that on, 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 uh, on YouTube. And I would like to hope that we can find a way to program some exterior dance uh, uh, installation or activity or a hybrid along the sculpture trail. I mean, we're, you know, the, the possibility, I mean, we did that one place where there was a violinist and there was a kind of procession, but I think there could be some, you know, other other inventions about how we could work with dance, music, and, and, and take it another level. I mean, I also think that, you know, the, um, uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> that, um, you know, the interdisciplinary nature, um, can evolve in different ways in terms of um, the relationship between art and science and you know right. philosophy and humanism. I mean, we had an Agnieszka Carancho that was pretty amazing, where she really deals with you know technology and science and and is a fantastic visual artist at the same time. Um, you know, I just feel like there's a, a lot of um, richness there as well to explore. In fact, our program, I mean, Irina can speak about that, but our program for the students is to engage science, deep ecology and in the cosmic space. And, uh, you know, we, we've written a program that really, the students really have to be, they have to do some scientific reading to begin their project. And we bring in those people, for example, like Kelly, neuroscientist, who had some incredible uh, conversations and readings and understanding aspects of neuroscience and how we can bring that in to architecture. So I, I definitely wish to explore that even further um, with scientists like her.
Wonderful. Thank you all so much for those answers. Um, so this might be a beautiful moment, speaking of cross-pollination and fusion, to turn it over to our poet today. Um, I'm so thrilled to welcome Mia Ayumi Mahotra here to the stage. Um, Mia is the author of Notes from the Birth Year from Bato Press, winner of the Bato Press Boom Chapbook Contest, and um, Isako Isako from Alice James Books, a winner of the Alice James Award. She's received several other awards, including the Natalis Gold Award for Poetry and the Hawker Prize for Southeast Asian Poetry. Uh, her poetry has appeared in numerous literary journals and anthologies, and she's a founding editor of Lantern Review. And with that, I would love to turn it over to you. Mia, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, it's, it's been so wonderful to sit in on this, um, this presentation and to learn about tea space. I'm deeply inspired by the conversation um, and everything that has happened over the years as you've sought to synthesize the arts and creative place for um, these incredible um, catalytic moments to, to occur. Um, so I just, I have a very brief reading for you all. Um, I'm going to read um, from the chat book that I just published um, called Notes from the Birth Year. Um, this is um, a collection of poems that explores beauty, loss, um, through the tender observations of mother care. Um, the collection is haunted by ghosts, by ancestral presence, and they, uh, the poems interweave um, lyric poetry, fragmentary prose, and their primary concern is the fight to become um, in matters of birth and aesthetic lineage. Um, so you, you may get a sense of that from um, this opening poem I'll start with. It's called Where Poems Come From. Could be from under a duck's wing, gray-brown feathers flecked with light or the duck itself, a muddy brown, eddying along pond edge. Camouflage, as in camoufle, the French verb for to disguise, or camoufle, whiff of smoke. Entering the aviary, you saw it first, a dabbling teal, scarcely distinguishable from foliage. Duck, I said, and pointed, quacked, and like that it was gone. How language dawns slowly, then all at once perception matched to meaning, a dry whitish lid working its way reptile-like up the bird's eye. This isn't really about the duck or the pointing, the naming. The point is that I saw you seeing a creature for the first time, standing motionless on the bridge, bits of debris shifting underfoot. Every day you make some new utterance, ball, more, Meow, closing the space between the world you live in and your name for it. Surprise, hunger, spoon. Or maybe this is about the duck. You, me, that dappled afternoon. The tender, wrecked moment before the duck was a duck, when it was nothing but a whiff of smoke blown across water, which all of us were once. One time you saw a duck on a pond, a green-winged teal, and it was the first time such a thing ever existed. Light startled off its back as it slid noiselessly across the water, bill riffling beneath the surface, turning this way, that, searching for something to eat, something we could not see, but knew all the same was there. Um, and I'll just end with this poem, um, which is entitled On Form, and it weaves language um, by Say Shonagon's uh, pillow book, I became a mother and I began to write like a Japanese woman, which is to say, I began to write like myself from the imaginary whence my mother's mother and her mother and her mother before her came. Things that are distant though near, festivals celebrated near the palace, the zigzag path leading up to the temple of Kurama. When I became a mother, my lines began to grow less mannered, less sculpted, and this wild, itinerant prose did not adhere to shapeliness. Instead, it spilled from birth into death and questions of beauty and my opinions about this and that, arranging itself as it wished, an unruly yet artful text. And so I began to build strange, unkempt houses for my words to live in. 
interior spaces without doors, only half imagined windows, which opened to passages where a person could wander lost for days. Not all peonies and lacquered fans after all. Though I wonder why this didn't happen earlier in school, for instance, when a professor handed me a book of haiku. Deeply irritating things. A man who discusses all sorts of subjects at random as though he knew everything. Tell me about the form mothering takes on the page, why it accumulates so fragments, notes, a slow painstaking assemblage. And I found myself heavy with the days and my belly bulged with them and the days accreted like lines. Things that give a clean feeling, an earthen cup, a new metal bowl, the play of the light on water as one pours it into a vessel. And that's all from me. Thank you so much for inviting me to um, close out your fantastic event. This was just spectacular. Thank you so much, Mia. That was so beautiful. Such a wonderful way to end today. Um, so inspiring all around. Thank you, Stephen, George, Rini, and Susan, um, and of course, Fong. And we would also like to thank Marissa and everyone at T-Space for really helping today. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and in our public events, like here in our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support our writers, editors, and operations here at the Rail. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Michelle Sager and David Rhodes. And we will conclude with a poetry reading by Diana Ricard. And please, now you can turn on your microphones and say goodbye as you all leave. Thank you so much for today. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was beautiful. Thank you. 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 Fabulous presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Rini. Thank you so much, Rini. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mia, for the beautiful reading. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we'll keep up yeah. our work and we'll come together. Yeah, hope to see you all in person. Can't wait. Can't wait to see the Bay. We're going to take a bus up there, take oh. a day up and pay a visit this summer for sure. So right. please keep up the good work. We oh. need you. So thank you, Susan. Thank you, Irini. Thank you, George. Right. Stephen, you know, went off early, but thank you. Thank you for me later also. Thank you for tuning in, you all. And um, yep. yeah, let's go to have lunch. We deserve our lunch now. Ciao, Jimmy. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye, Take care. Guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye.